For hundreds of years, in the city of Sarajevo, Catholic Croats, Serbian Orthodox, Muslims and Jews all lived together. But when Yugoslavia disintegrated in the 1990s, many Serbian, Croatian and some Bosnian political leaders said, we can no longer live like this. Many people believed that and war came. But in Bosnia's capital, Sarajevo, not everyone quite got that message. This is their story. For three years, the city of Sarajevo was cut off from the rest of the world by the Bosnian Serbs. Its great buildings went up in flames. More than 12,000 people were killed by mortars and Bosnian Serb gunfire. Walls were built to hide people from snipers. Signs were even put up to warn people, but it didn't always help. The Bosnian Serbs cut off water to the city, so this park in the center of the town was where people came to do their washing and fill plastic jugs to bring water home, to drink, to bathe in, and to flush the toilet. And this is how they got it home. An entire society was reduced to scrounging dodging snipers, selling whatever they had, or hoped to sell, and then coming home to burn a few books or a chair to keep warm, and cook on a wood stove set up in the living room. A once great multi-ethnic city in Europe was slowly dying. The Americans and Europeans sent in food from time to time, but mostly they watched from the sidelines as Sarajevo was bombed. People were losing hope, clinging on. Even though most Serbs and Croats had left Sarajevo, some had chosen not to listen to their political leaders and felt that different people could still live together. So these Serbs and Croats, along with Muslims and Jews, continued to live alongside each other in Sarajevo. And they were buried together. On the night the shelling started, in May 1992, people from the neighborhood sought shelter at the city's main synagogue. That's when community leaders like Ivica Cereshnes, an architect, and Jakob Finci, a lawyer, offered them shelter for the night and food the next day. Soon others heard about what was going on in the synagogue and about La Benevolencia, the community's humanitarian aid agency. Not only did people come looking for help, they came looking to help. So let's meet some of them. The medical team. This is Serdjan, who became the chief doctor for La Benevolencia. He worked with Yadranka, another doctor. And Jasna was the nurse. Mirjana served as a pharmacist. For security, there was Adnan. And although he never had any trouble from anyone, he could call on Sharif, whose job was actually cutting wood for the kitchen. And in the kitchen, Tsitsko was the cook. And Mara helped him serve. And Novitsa brought in food from the warehouse. In the office, Slobodan ran the computers for the community. Atso was the secretary. And Vera, the treasurer. And Sonia was head of the women's club, La Bohoreta. For communication, Vlado worked the two-way radio. While Timo kept the logbook in the radio room. And Dejan helped deliver the post. Which one of these volunteers was Jewish, a Muslim, a Catholic Croat, or Serbian Orthodox? At La Benevolencia, nobody asked, nobody cared. Here is how La Benevolencia operated during the war. Sirjan tended patients in the community center, but he also made house calls to people like Donka Nikolic, 
well into her 90s who needed an injection every week just to keep breathing. During the war, the Bosnian Serbs cut off postal deliveries. So the Jewish community managed to bring letters into the city. They would ask journalists to smuggle a post in and bring it to the synagogue where letters were filed. Then people were phoned and they heard those wonderful words, you've got mail. Since international phone lines were cut, La Benevolencia set up a two-way radio system to the outside world. Families from all over Sarajevo came to use it and send messages to loved ones abroad. With help from the outside world, mostly from the American Joint Distribution Committee and World Jewish Relief in London, La Benevolencia set up three pharmacies and everything in it was free. Even a dentist came to the community center as did children from the local neighborhood who came for puppet shows and celebrations, anything to take their minds off what they could not have at home and to show them that somebody cared. Many older Sarajevans had sent their children and grandchildren abroad and that left them all alone. So the Jewish women's group, La Bahoreta, kept its members busy, creating treats for the children and spending their time together. During the siege of Sarajevo, La Benevolencia worked with the JDC and World Jewish Relief arranging rescue convoys. The largest was in February 1994. To make it happen, JDC sent in a logistics expert to meet with the Bosnian Prime Minister and with the Bosnian Serbs, and finally, the UN garrison. When all the permissions were finally arranged, lists were drawn up and the buses made ready. And those approved made their way to the Jewish community. The old boarded the buses, the young, and they prepared to leave the city they were born in, the city they loved. The UN escorted the convoy out of the besieged city. They picked their way carefully across no man's land and entered into Bosnian Serb territory. That's where the UN remained and the convoy, carrying 294 Serbs, Croats, Muslims and Jews, made its way across the war zone and down to the coast of Croatia, its final destination. A journey that normally took five hours took this convoy more than 20. Of the 294 people on that convoy, here are two of their stories. You are looking at Zeynaba Hadaga the first Muslim ever to receive a Righteous Gentile Award from Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust Museum, for saving a Jewish neighbor during the Holocaust. Her daughter Sarah and granddaughter Stella cared for her, along with Serjan, the Serbian doctor who worked for the Jewish community and cared for his Muslim friends. Zainaba and her family were invited to come to Israel and they left on that convoy in 1994. You didn't abandon the Jews, Milton Wolf, the JDC president, told her. And we won't abandon you. And when she arrived in Israel, Prime Minister Rabin welcomed her. Denis Karelich, also a Muslim, was 13 years old in 1994. He helped bring water to the Jewish community. His father and he lived with Nada Levi. And Dennis's father also helped in the Jewish community. Back then, Dennis was best friends with Rasho, Nada's grandson. Dennis and Rasho went through their school books even though they couldn't go to school. In January 1994, Dennis was slightly wounded in a mortar attack. It was Serjan who picked the glass out of his shoulder and back. And his father told him, you're going to Israel, even though I can't go so that you can be safe. It's not easy leaving your home. It's not easy for a father to say goodbye to a son. 
but Rasho and Dennis rode through the night and the next day, and for the first time in 22 months, Dennis was finally in a place where no one was shooting at him. In the years ahead, Dennis would live in Jerusalem and finish school in Haifa before moving to Vienna, where he spent a decade at the Holocaust Restitution Agency before beginning a job in the Vienna Jewish Museum. When someone asked why a Muslim from Bosnia would work in Jewish organizations, Dennis said, I remember what the Jews of Sarajevo and my friends in Israel did for me when I needed help. Maybe by working here today, I can pay a little of that back.